Diego. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, Professor Friedman. Professor Friedman, in 1946, the McGraw-Hill publication reported that the total tax taken in the United States was about 22 percent and suggested that if it became 25 percent that it would lead to the destruction of our capitalist uh, economic system. Now it's 40 percent, as you suggested tonight. Is this a gradual destruction that takes place or is it a catastrophic? Uh, how, how much can the tax take to come before it really gets to be dangerous? There is. A, it's dangerous now. But there is no magic number. It's clear that as that number grows, it becomes more and more difficult to maintain a free society. But where the breaking point is will vary from case to case to illustrate. In the case of Chile, the breaking point came at 40%. The level of government spending had risen to 40% of the national income under Allende. And that was a point at which the breaking point came and the system fell apart and a military government stepped in and you had a loss of freedom. But Chile is a much less developed, a much less wealthy country than we are. In Great Britain, the percentage has gotten up to 60% and Great Britain has not collapsed. The breaking point there is apparently higher than 60%. In, uh, in uh, I Israel, the percentage is something like 70%. Now, I should explain a little bit to you on that, because that percentage is a very misleading percentage. You know, accountants are marvelous people. <laughs> and the way in which you run the national accounts, there is really nothing to prevent the per government spending as a ratio to national income from being 120%. Because these are two different concepts. And I believe all of these numbers really greatly overstate the role of government spending. They don't overstate the role of government influence. Now, the other thing that needs to be said is that government can have a lot of influence over your life without spending any money. Those two are quite different. For example, every automobile you drive has maybe five or seven hundred dollars of equipment on it that is mandated by the government. You paid for it. That doesn't enter into government spending. Or again, uh, the uh, the. Uh, administrative body that administers the Interstate Commerce Commission doesn't spend much money. But its effects has been to destroy the railroad industry. So that you can have great effects without spending money. So the simple answer to your question is that there's no magic number, but the larger it is, the more dangerous it is. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I have a question about public housing. Sure. I agree with you when you say that the number of dwellings destroyed is greater than the number of dwellings put up. But you are comparing the number of dwellings that are destroyed are three-story apartment buildings left over from the 19th century. And the <coughs> dwellings that are put up are about 20 stories high and have about eight families per floor. Oh, I mean the number of dwelling units, not the number of buildings. By, when I spoke, uh, I, I, I was not careful and I should have been. I meant the number of dwelling units where a dwelling unit is something that houses a family. So in the case of the buildings you're talking about, I wouldn't count that as one eight-story building versus one three-story building. But the number of dwelling units built is less than the number destroyed. Maybe How does that improve the housing? Maybe you dislike the public housing because of the institutional look to it, and that it looks more like a hotel and looks less homely. But the no, alternative no, is to do with it. the alternative is either you have a public house or you have a More. badly maintained apartment building by an absentee landlord. And there are no dwelling units in this country that are more badly maintained than public housing dwelling units. In the South Bronx, people are destroying their houses. Of course, why? They why? are burning their houses why? to move into public housing. Of course, housing. Housing. but why are they burning those houses and abandoning? Why? Badly maintained. No, sir. Because you have rent control in New York City, which makes it uneconomical to maintain the houses and means that the only way in which you can get any money out of them is by burning them down. 
Also, an absentee landlord is very... Absentee landlordism, of course. But you mean to say that the public housing units are not absentee landlords? <laughs> Look, I am not, you, you must understand, I think it's important for people to have decent housing. My objection to public housing is that it's made the housing of the poor worse. You've torn down how dwellings in which they live. You've put up in part, if you take the whole housing program, urban renewal plus public housing, the situation is even worse. You've torn down more dwelling units than you've put up. Of those you put up, a considerable fraction have not been available to the poor. You've torn down low-income dwelling units. <coughs> Take any urban renewal area in this country you want. You've tor torn down low-income dwelling units and you've put up luxury apartments. And that's helping the housing of the poor? Not by a long sight. So that the problem is, and then in the, in the public housing units you've set up, because of the income requirements and so on, the people who can qualify for them tend to be broken families. They have an abnormally high rate of, of juvenile delinquency, <coughs> of sabotage, of destruction. They are poorly maintained. You see, the problem that this young man is illustrating is the tendency that we often have to take the will for the deed. The problem isn't the objective of the public housing units. The point is to go out and see what's actually happened with them. And there is hardly anybody who has studied the subject who will defend the public housing program as having improved the housing of the poor. Yes, sir. I, I was interested before you had mentioned the, a comparison between 19th century and 20th century America. I'd like to know if you think that that's, you know, I don't see how that could be considered a legitimate comparison in terms of, in terms of the fact that, you know, there were unlimited resources essentially in the 19th century and, and now we have a kind of very limited resource and, and allocation situation. At least this seems to be the thrust of a lot of economists I know, but you know, that's, economists that, that's fundamentally saying. wrong. And, well, just <laughs> let, let me, before, before, before I'm, yeah, before sure, I'm you go ahead. Uh, sure. let me finish the question. Uh, in the 19th century, when you had a completely free economy, uh, you seem to have situations developing where uh, tycoons would come along like Rockefeller or the railroad barons, essentially, and they'd come to dominate society. So. Is, is it not a choice, do we ha not have a choice between developing that kind of situation where John D. Rockefeller and that crowd will decide what's good for our society or whether the government officials will? Well, let's take the Rockefellers and just stick with them. Who John created D. the Rockefeller. University of Chicago, incidentally. I know, he founded, <laughs> the, he founded the University of Chicago. Tell me, John D. Rockefeller did a great deal of good for this country. He developed and promoted, I'm not talking about his charitable activities, that was separate not even about the founding of the University of Chicago. But he uh, developed and into a major industry, the, the oil industry of, of refining, discovering, and making oil available. He reduced its cost. He never got a dollar from anybody with a gun. He got his money by selling people products at a lower cost than other people could provide it. His grandson, Nelson Rockefeller, did enormous harm to the country by operating through the political channel. Did, did I tell you that? If Nelson. <laughs> if Nelson Rockefeller had. If we had the 19th century version, and Nelson Rockefeller, with all his accumulated wealth, had tried his hardest to spend that in such a way as to reduce the freedom and the affluence of other people, he could not have come close to achieving what he did achieve in that direction as, as a political figure. He couldn't even have afforded to put up the Albany Mall. <laughs> Let alone to have undertaken the measures which made New York State a basket case, <laughs> which, re which, which changed the educational structure of New York State, in my opinion, in a very adverse direction. But let me go back to your first question. First place, it is simply not true that we have limited resources now, whereas we had unlimited resources in the 19th century. On the contrary. From every important economic point of view, we have a greater volume of resources now than we had then. Tell me, in 1850, how much oil did we have? We, we had it hadn't been discovered. It was useless. <laughs> we had no oil. The first oil well was discovered, came, was, was drilled in Titusville in 1858. 
We have more oil now than we had in 1850 in the meaningful economic sense. Before nuclear power was discovered, how much nuclear power and energy did we have? The progress of, the progress of technology has had the effect of increasing the effective volume of resources available to us so that we have far greater resources available now than we had in the 19th century as a result of the technological and business developments that were produced. Is government regulation of the resources necessary? Not at all. Government regulation of resources of the kind we've had has led to waste and misuse of resources. So, so that, really, go back, look at your, your analysis. What matters are the resources that are available to be used, not those that will be discovered later on. Of course, one more thing needs to be said. We are, of course, wealthier and better off than were the people in the 19th century. But we are their heirs. We could not be where we are if they had not done what they did. And I think it's a false comparison not to take into account the debt which we owe to the enormous economic progress and development of the 19th century, to the fact that our ancestors came here with empty hands and have made it possible for us to have a decent life. I hate to use the old cliche about standing on their shoulders, but that's what we do. Yes, sir. Professor Friedman, how is it that uh, Germany which has one of the highest social security systems in the world, is better off economically than the USA. Germany is not better off economically than the USA. It's a great deal better off economically than Great Britain is at the moment. But it is not a great deal better off than the United States. It's relatively well off. Why? Because in, 18, in 1948, there was a name, man by the name of Ludwig Erhardt who had the good sense on one Sunday afternoon <coughs> And he did it on Sunday because the American, British, and French occupation forces offices were closed on Sunday. And he knew if he did it on a weekday, they would countermand his order. And so on that Sunday, he abolished all price and wage controls and rationing that had been in existence. And he unleashed in Germany a free market economy. And Germany, with a free market economy, had an economic miracle. That miracle will not last if Germany long continues to hamper its free market economy by a still greater growth of social security, welfare, and other measures. But in general, the actual extent and level of those measures is not terribly different in Germany from what it is now. Some of them, in some areas, it's greater what it is here. In some areas, it's greater. In some areas, it's less. But the most important difference between the two countries is that Germany in the past 30 years has been willing to rely to a far greater extent on private markets and private market arrangements than we have. You know, I was saying before in answer to an earlier question, there's no magic number, 30%, 25%, 40%, which a government can spend, and spend while having a viable economy. How much it can spend depends on the other policies which it follows. It depends also on the attitudes and structure of the people. As I was saying, with a homogeneous people, you can go much farther than with a heterogeneous people. So I would say that Germany has done as well as it has, despite and not because of the welfare measures you were mentioning. Um, in America, it has been argued by some that there are no pervasive values that would uh, form the basis of the private sector performing in the altruistic manner you think it will. But instead, the only pervasive value in this country is material self-interest. And therefore, the private sector is not inclined to perform in the altruistic way that you think it will. And as a result of that, the welfare state has sprung up as the only alternative for the disadvantage in the society. Well, let's look at the situation. Was it a pure interest in material welfare and self-well-being that built the University of Rochester and the thousands of other private universities around the country? Was it the material interest in immediate self-welfare that produced the private non-profit uh, non hospitals around the country that, that were so prominent a feature, let alone the Carnegie Libraries, let alone all the others? It's quite the opposite. There is no question about the evidence that the United States has had a unique 
almost unique experience of private charitable eleemosynary activity on a broad scale. But now I come to the other stores, Gore. Again, you are looking at it in terms of objectives and not results. You are assuming that these welfare programs do help the disadvantaged. You are assuming that government activity helps the disadvantaged. If I take people of your race, in what respect are the black people in this country most disadvantaged? In respect to the kind of schooling they can get. Why? Because that schooling is provided by the government. <coughs> Where do you get the idea that the, the, that the disadvantaged are being helped? The blacks are in the first place forced to have bad schooling because the state provides it. In the second place, having been put under that disadvantage, they are being prevented from getting on the job training by a minimum wage law, which is the most anti-Negro law we have on our books, all in order to help the poor, no doubt. That's the purpose of it. That, that's said to be the purpose of it. But what's the effect of it? So what I, am, what I am trying to say to you is that it's all very well to talk about using the state, but explain to me how it is that a people who in their separate lives have en are driven only by material self-interest are somehow in their collective capacity driven by altruistic impulses. How do you reconcile the one or the other? See, the basic situation as it appears to me is almost the opposite. Most people are selfish in a narrow material sense. And when, they, when the government is run by most people, when you have a majoritarian democracy, the government is going to reflect their preferences and their taste. The only way in which you can have non-material values become effective is by having a society in which a minority can express itself. Which are the most materialist countries in the world? There is no country in the world more materialist than Russia. All it talks about is its five-year plans, its material accomplishments, its material plans. It, it is not altruistic. On the other, so that in, at any time, in any society, I don't care what it is, the fraction of the public that is going to be interested in the well-being of others and in things other than their n fairly narrow self-interest is going to be a minority. And the question is, how do you construct a system in which that minority is least hindered? And in my opinion, that's a system in which government has very limited power and in which private voluntary activity has a maximum of opportunity to develop. Thank you. Let's see if we can get some more questions here. I, yes, sir. Um, given that the best intentions of the government has failed to provide adequate... The government housing, has no intentions. <laughs> <laughs> Only people have intentions. Uh, the best intentions among the people in power in government has failed to provide adequate housing for the poor. Oh, go slowly. I, I never talked about the best intentions of the people in power in government. I talked about the good intentions of the people who promoted those legislation, that legislation. Once you get legislation, the people who get in power in government are people who want power, not people who have good intentions. Oh, yeah. That's a very different thing. Though it's not really the question I had in mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work our way around to it. <laughs> what, I, what I was hoping to ask is what specific policies you propose which would lead to adequate housing for all the poor? Well, in the first place, you know, these are words that really have no clear meaning. Adequate housing for all the poor. Those are not definable words. What's adequate? What we now consider inadequate would have been considered a palace 150 years ago. It would be considered a palace abroad. I don't know if you all know the story about the, uh, about the movie that was made out of John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. And it was shown during the war, or I think shortly thereafter, but I think during the war in the Soviet Union. And it had to be withdrawn because the people were so excited and interested about the quality of the clothes and shoes that the Okies going out west were wearing. <laughs> it backfired. So adequate, poor, the average, the, 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 the income which we now use in this country as a governmental standard to separate the poor from the not poor is higher than the average income of all the people in the Soviet Union. 
It's decidedly higher than the average income of most of the people in the world. These are not absolute standards, they're relative. So you have to ask a very different kind of question. What kind of system will give the widest range of people the greatest opportunity to make the most out of themselves, out of their own capacities, their own resources? What are the plans for doing that? I don't, I'm not going to try to have a program which will give adequate housing to the poor. I want to have a system under which individuals can, can have as much opportunity as possible to develop themselves and in which other people can have as much opportunity as they, possible to help other people. And I, would, I, I say that system would be a system of essentially free enterprise, private enterprise capitalism with a, with a very limited government. And in that system, you have in fact achieved higher standards of housing than you have through other me methods. The number of privately built houses has always vastly exceeded the number of government uh, built houses. So that I, 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 I'm not answering your question directly, but I'm going at it indirectly. You and I seem to have been involved in indirect circles. Thank you. Yes, sir. Professor Friedman, there are certain social goods that cannot be supplied by uh, the private marketplace. Such as what? Um, well, let's say there's, there are goods that either the marginal benefits cannot be separated or that they're so lumpy that... Such as what? Uh, roads, I want examples. For roads? Roads. You can Are have private toll roads. You've had them for years. Is uh, there any reason why this interstate highway that you have, the, uh, the uh, great interstate uh, New York Thruway, is there any reason why that couldn't be leased out to private enterprises to run? And uh, they could finance it by charging a fee? Okay, my question concerns social goods. I, yeah. Do you accept the fact that there are certain goods that the private economy cannot supply. Uh, uh, I accept that there are goods which the private economy is not likely to supply. I accept that there are goods in which it is difficult through a private economic system to charge everybody who gets the benefits from it. Okay. In those cases, however, it is also true that it's not easy for the government to supply it. You see, the problem with the direction you're going is that there's a strong tendency to say, here's a market failure. I have no way in which uh, Rochester University can be made to pay those citizens of Rochester whose shirt is dirtied by the amount of smoke that comes from Rochester University's chimneys. I mean, that's a market failure. Rochester is imposing a cost on people and ought to pay them for it. It's buying their services, in effect, their services of letting their shirts get dirty so that Rochester can heat its building. Right now. That's true, that's a problem. But in those same cases, it's also difficult to have government do anything about it. And if you're going to consider cases of market failure like that, you have to put into the balance the fact that when government seeks to achieve an answer to it, you're likely to have a government failure. I agree. Yeah. Okay, I was leading up to this question. <laughs> like, okay, considering that there are externalities, it's like, as you said, pollution. Right. How can government limit itself to distinguish between the social goods and the private goods? It, well, it cannot. And there is no easy way to limit it. There are hard questions. There isn't an easy answer for every question. And the, my answer would be to you, twofold. It would be, first of all, if government decides to do something in that area, it will do least harm and most good if it does it via effluent charges or the equivalent, rather than via setting standards or imposing specific requirements. Second, government ought not to step in and try to do anything unless there is a very, very strong case that the net disadvantages, the net third party effects are of significant magnitude because the costs of doing it are significant. Government is going to do it imperfectly, and you're comparing one imperfection with another. And I think we've had a great deal of experience by now, which suggests that you're about as likely to make matters worse as you are better. That's not a clean and neat answer. And I don't think you can get a clean and neat answer, because I think in all of these cases, you're dealing with a balance sheet. 
in which there are certain advantages of the proposed action, there are certain disadvantages, and you have to weigh them up. And all I'm urging is that you make sure you look at both sides of that balance sheet and not only at one. That you don't take the naive view, which so often is taken, that lo and behold, there's an evidence of a market failure, boom, government should step in and do something about it, without taking into account the possibility of a government failure as well. Thank you. If the middle class control this coalition that you were talking about earlier, why are they so upset with the way the government is handling their life and, and their share of the pie? I was explaining that to you earlier. And that was because they really don't get anything out of it. They're all, each one separately, you see, it's a fallacy of composition. It is true, every individual program works this way. But what you gain on the one, you lose on the other. And the problem is that you have a system under which each one of us tends to have concentrated interests in certain ways, and the costs are diffuse. And therefore, each one of us gets our program but at the expense of paying everybody else's. Right. And so the net outcome is that, uh, that uh, we may be worse off. And what you have is a situation in which you have, uh, as it were, a local equilibrium, but you don't have a global equilibrium, mm -hmm. in which good. there's an, a, a drastic rearrangement, which would make everybody better off. Right. But if that's the situation, why can't we uh, find a a method to overcome all these impediments and arrive at this global equilibrium because if I hope we can that, the purpose of my talking this way and of your listening and of our trying to persuade one another is to try to see if we can find a way to do it and I think the way to do it is to try to wrap these programs together and have uh, attack uh, attack it through some kind of constitutional limitations on the aggregate amount that can be spent in these ways Thank you. Yes. Thank you.